want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 16, Matthew chapter 16. And last year, when we looked at missions, we looked at the first, I don't expect you to remember this, but we looked last year at the first part of this passage. Today we're going to be looking at the latter part of this passage. Uh, we'll begin reading in verse 13, and really the section we'll be looking at this morning are verses 21 through 27. This fits in with our theme, At What Cost? So let's stand together as we hear God's holy and inerrant word. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you're Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. The gates of Hades will not overpower it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. And then he warned the disciples that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. And from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned to Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests but man." Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. Let's bow our heads in prayer. So, Father, we pray for our dear sister. We pray for Sandra. Lord, we thank you that she is in your firm and loving hand. And, Father, we lift her up to you. We ask you to minister to her during this hour. We pray for Mike. We pray for Amy. And we pray for Andy. Pray for the whole family. Lord, we thank you for Dwight. We thank you for the blessing that he has been to us as a church family, the friend that he is to so many of us. We thank you for the way that he reflected the joy of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Father, we pray for Connie and we ask that you will minister her. We pray for Krista. We pray, Lord, for Kendra. We pray for Josh. Be with them at this time. We pray for your blessing upon the service that will follow this afternoon. We thank you, Lord, that you are the resurrection and the life. Lord, as we talk about missions today, we pray you'll give us a heart, the same heart that you have, the heart for the peoples of the world, those who you laid down your life for upon the cross. Lord, we know that your Holy Spirit is working and enacting your will that your gospel is going forth, that you're bringing your people to yourself. And we ask, Lord, that you will involve us in this process, in this glorious, glorious work. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Jim Elliott, Christian missionary and martyred by the Aka Indians in the 1950s, is quoted very often. Some of his quotes go like this, Wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. The will of God is always bigger than we bargain for, but we must believe that whatever it involves, it is good and acceptable and perfect. Father, 
make me a crisis man. Bring those I contact to decision. Let me not be a milepost on the road. Make me a fork that men must turn one way or another on facing Christ in me. And then his most famous quote, quote you know, quote you have heard often, and a quote which summarizes the verses that we're looking at this morning. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. The Lord Jesus Christ has, in this passage, just spoken to his disciples, and he has promised them the glorious promise that he is going to build his church. And involved in that promise is the fact that in spite of whatever hell or this world might throw at the church, no matter what hell or the world might marshal against the church, he is going to build his church. He will build his church. And he has said in this passage that the way that he principally will build this church is through the testimony of his people. His people declaring that he is the Son of God. And that testimony not originating within them, but originating within the work of God's sovereign Holy Spirit in their lives. And what he is saying in this promise is that regardless, he's going to build his church. Now what he tells us then, two things, is that building of the church is going to cost. And that building of the church is going to bring gain. Those two things. So let's look at them this morning. First of all, the cost. Look with me at verses 21 through 23. From, the, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man." The first cost that we see is the cost of suffering. And this is exactly what the Lord Jesus says in this passage, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things. It is necessary for him to suffer. It is necessary if the church is to be built, if the nations are to be won, if the gospel is to go forth, if millions of lives are to be brought to Christ and to be saved and rescued from hell, Christ is must suffer. There's no other way. This must happen if those things are to be accomplished and the church is to be built. And it will, and he will do it, but suffering is absolutely necessary. And Peter hears this, and he says, no. He says, may it never be, Lord. He says, as it were, to Christ, there has to be a better way than suffering. You're talking about crucifixion, Lord. And that's ridiculous. We have to find another way to do this. And what Christ is saying is that there is no other way. It must happen. Read it in the passage. It's there in print. Suffering is absolutely necessary for the work of world missions, missions, the building of the church to be accomplished. When I was in seminary for a year, I carried around a book like this with me. It was my companion. And it was for a class in church history. It was by Kenneth Latterette. The print was much, it made me almost go blind, the print was much smaller than this, like a phone book. And the reason I carried it with me is because of all the other reading I had to do. If I didn't open this whenever I could and read it, I would never make it all the way through. And it was the history of the spread of Christian missions around the world. And those two volumes could be subtitled, The Hardship, the Deprivation, 
and the death of Christ's followers in the glorious effort of furthering the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. That could be the title of that book because it takes suffering, it takes deprivation, it takes hardship, and yes, at times, it takes death to further the work of the Lord Jesus Christ around the world. The cost is suffering. If we believe there is such a thing as missions without hardship, if we believe there is such a thing as missions without suffering, we are sadly mistaken because that is the nature of the work that God has called us to. Next Sunday you'll have an opportunity to hear of that work in depth through the voice of the martyrs. The second thing that Christ says is found in verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The second thing that is needed, not only is there suffering, but there must be sacrifice. This is a passage that talks about death to ourselves. You know, in our culture, this one verse in contemporary Christian culture in America, if our contemporary Christian culture in America could have it, they would take this verse out of the Bible because it contradicts basically what many Christians believe. If they could write the Bible, it would go something. If they could write these verses, it would go something like this. It would go like this. If anyone wishes to come after me, let him or her fulfill themselves, take up their best life now, and follow me. That's the way it would be rewritten. Because in our contemporary American culture, our desire is that we want to wear a Hawaiian shirt and flip-flops to a war. We want to be like medical students who would rather play video games than immersing themselves in a clinic of dying people who desperately need their skill and their help. You see, Christ calls us in this verse to not fulfill ourselves. He calls us to come die with him. He calls us to die to ourselves. What he's calling us to is the self-crucifixion of who we once were. The self-crucifixion of our desires, of our wants, of our needs for the sake of the gospel of Christ. That's what he's calling us to. This isn't an uncommon thing. A number of decades ago, Wilbur Rees wrote these words, I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. Not enough to explode my soul or disturb my sleep, but just enough to equal a cup of warm milk or a snooze in the sunshine. I don't want enough of him to make me love the unlovely or cause me to wash another person's feet. I want ecstasy, not transformation. I want the warmth of the womb, not a new birth. I want the comfort of a Savior, not the command of a Lord. I want a pound of the eternal in a paper sack. I would like to buy $3 worth of God, please. What we have to understand as believers is that this call of discipleship, this call to take up our cross and to follow Christ, this call applies to us here in America just as much as it applies to the Chinese Christian farmer who is persecuted in the local communist, by the local communists for his faith, just as much as it applies to the Egyptian Christian who loses his family in his hardware store because he converted from Islam, just as much as it calls upon the British missionary who will live for 34 years with a tribe of aborigines in the outback of Australia and die of dysentery at age 55. This is the same call upon us it's upon a North Korean believer whose faith is seen as despicable by his government, whose family is arrested for his faith, who is sent to a prison where he has no rights, no recourse for any mistreatment. His family will be murdered if he even tries to commit suicide to free himself of the pain in the prison camp. He will be, as others have, hung on a cross over a fire, crushed by a steamroller, 
herded off bridges, trampled underfoot, or have molten steel poured down his throat. Same calling to all of us. To take up our cross and to follow Christ. It's very practical. It's simply that we must follow Christ's command. And then look with me thirdly, it's the cost of suffering, it's the cost of sacrifice, and it's the cost of life. Look with me in verse 25, he says, for whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. There's a cost that Christ calls for, it's the cost of our whole life, that's what he calls for, the cost of our whole life. How will you use your life in the work of Christ's mission? Are you willing to suffer for Christ's mission? Are you willing to sacrifice? You know, last year we had a wonderful mission speaker, and he uh, really one of the most gifted pastors that I know. And he is retired now, but his church for many, many years was used of God in the work of world missions. And he travels around preaching for missions conferences. While he was here, I asked him, I said, how many people, what percentage in your church are involved in missions? Now, his church is known as a strong missions church in the PCA. He said about 40%. About 40%. I believe that we can do better than that. I believe that we as a church can do far better than that. I believe that we as a church will choose not to ignore what Christ is talking about in this passage. And I have reason to believe that because we have a long history in the work of missions through the years. As a matter of fact, this church, through the ministry of those who started this church and certainly through the ministry of Grady Simpson, was founded with a trajectory toward missions. And I believe that we can do better of that because almost every single year we have more than 100 people in our congregation who go on some form of missions trip. So I truly believe that we can do far better than 40% of our people having an interest to speak of in the work of world missions. How can you go about doing that? Well, it comes through submitting your heart to God. And that begins with prayer. That's where submission starts. It starts with prayer. And seeking the Lord's face. And asking for God to work in your heart. So pray to Him. Ask Him to give you a burden, His burden, for the world around you. And then think about You can do this. You can think of one missionary couple or individual that we're involved with and adopt them and begin to pray specifically for them through the year. You can write them, too, at Christmas or on their birthday. But pray for them. It begins with prayer. Secondly, it has to do with a willingness in your heart to say to God, Lord, if you want me to go to the mission field, I will. That should be on every single one of our hearts. Lord, if you want me to go to the mission field, I will. You say, well, that doesn't include every Christian. Is there anything in life, really, that you should say to God, I want your will in my life except this area? I don't think there's an area. And every single one of us should be willing in our heart to say, Lord, you call me and I am willing to go doesn't matter what age. It could be 14 years old and begin the preparation process. How old was Moses when he led the people out of Israel? He was 80 years old. (laughs) doesn't matter. Are you willing? Are you praying? Are you seeking what God would have you to do in your life concerning His will? It's true of all of us. Are you willing to go? Thirdly, 
you can support. You can support world missions. If, if the people in our church who are not giving to missions, if they just began to give $25 a month, if you gave just $25 a month, you would be helping us to begin to continue to support our missionaries, and you would put about a quarter of a missionary on the field. Just $25 a month. Steve may correct my figures. That's okay. $50 a month, you could do mathematically twice that. All of us can do something. All of us can take a card. All of us can write and say, we can do this. We can simply skip a meal and support missions. If we skipped a meal a month, and gave it toward missions, it would have an impact. We can give. We give by faith promise. And what faith promise means is that we seek the Lord's face and we ask, how much would you have me give? And then you begin to look for that amount during the year as God blesses you and gives in that way. But pray, God, what would you have me give? We can pray to be willing to go. We give. And let me tell you one more thing. You talk. If you will talk to others about missions, if you will talk to others about a trip that you've taken, if you talk to others the way that God has worked in your life through being involved in missions, if you talk with others, it will stimulate the work of missions in the life of the church. You pray. You be willing to go, you give, and you talk. That's the cost. What's the gain? What is the gain? Well, look with me at verse 25. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The first thing that we gain is true life. We gain true life. If we're willing to lose our life in this life, we gain our life. If we're willing to lose our life, as he says, for Christ's sake, we will find it. The glorious passage in the New Testament on the resurrection is 1 Corinthians chapter 15. It speaks about the re resurrection. And in that passage, it says at the end, Therefore, be, beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for your labor is not in vain. When Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, every loss for His kingdom became a gain. At the point of the resurrection, He flipped the table. And so whatever suffering we experience for the sake of Christ's mission, and this life is something that is quickly forgotten. Every sacrifice that we make for Christ's mission in this life is not even worthy, as Paul says, to be compared with the glory that is to follow. Every sacrifice that we make in this life, every loss that we have, for Christ's sake, is a loss that we will be eternally thankful for because of the new heavens and the new earth. All losses for Christ's kingdom have become gains, eternal gains. William, William Kelly lived in a small village in Scotland, but the people at the University of Aberdeen and the University of Edinburgh began to notice something young people from those two villages began to stream into Edinburgh and began to stream into Aberdeen for college. They hadn't seen anything like it. And William Kelly was a very gifted intellect who had no formal training whatsoever. And he was an outstanding student of the Scripture, but he was also an outstanding tutor in mathematics and science and various other disciplines and he was taking young people, he was helping them in their studies, preparing them for university, also discipling them for the Lord Jesus Christ, 
and sending them into the universities. And one of the professors began to trace this back, and he went to Kelly and he said, why don't you come to school? You're helping all these other people go to school. Why don't you come to school? And he said to Kelly, you, don't you want to make a name for yourself in the world? And William Kelly said, which world? Which world? He who loses his life for Christ's sake finds it. He finds it. She finds it. The second gain that is gained in the life is the gain of changed lives for eternity. We find our own life, but we also do the lives of others changed for eternity. John G. Patton, one of the great missionary autobiographies, if you want to read something that reads far better than any novel, read the autobiography of John G. Patton. He went to the New Hebrides Islands to minister to the cannibals of all people. And he saw the lives changed. He said, at the moment I put the bread and wine, speaking of serving them communion, at the moment I put the bread and wine into those hands, once stained with the blood of cannibalism, now stretched out to receive and partake the emblems and seals of the Redeemer's love, I had a foretaste of the joy of glory that well nigh broke my heart to pieces. I shall never taste a deeper bliss till I gaze on the glorified face of Jesus himself. The gain of true life but also the gain of lives changed for eternity as we're involved in the building of Christ's church. In Belize, hundreds of children's lives have been affected by the love of Christ through the gospel. And those who have faithfully gone shared with those children. Many of those who have gone have been teenagers and their lives have been infect, effect, affected for eternity. It is not until eternity will we truly understand the impact that has been had in Belize. And it is not until eternity that we'll truly understand the years of missions work going out from this church, sent out to touch lives, leaders changed, Christians discipled, lives in Africa, in Spain, and I know I'm going to miss some, in Northern Ireland, Scotland, Jamaica, Mexico, China, Russia, the Ukraine, Tanzania, Kenya, nations that cannot even be named because of security reasons. Lives touch, lives change for eternity. I think about Luke and Michelle ministering in Hungary and how they're ministering in high schools. High schools, it's sad to think of this, high schools in Hungary that have far greater openness and where we have far greater access than to the high schools just around us. I think about sitting with Luke in a cafeteria at UAB and talking with him about God's call on his life. He was there as an absolutely straight-A student in pre-med and physics and had a scholarship waiting for him through medical school, and his answer was, God is calling me to Hungary. I think about Gary and Jackie, as you saw today, training members to effectively build children's programs and ministry, multiplying themselves exponentially through the lives of leaders and teachers in those churches, and going to places that are forgotten by most other people but are in desperate need and quite honestly and literally are very dangerous. And yet they're going. Think about Rainy in Japan, talking with someone Friday about her ministry in Japan. They had been there and they had seen Rainy from another church. Rainy in Japan, there with a team, but nevertheless going by herself, going to be with a team, what courage that took in a country that is so incredibly in need of the gospel. Changed lives. The gain of people's lives changed for eternity. 
And then finally, the gain of God's gracious reward. Christ says this. He says, For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of His Father with His angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. What we do for God, God never forgets. He never forgets. And what we do for God, there'll never be a regret. You will never in ever, any think about this, ever in eternity, regret what you have done for Christ's kingdom. You'll never regret it. Ever. The gain of God's gracious reward. A few summers ago, we had a class for the rising college students, and it was on apologetics. And one of the areas we talked about was evolution. So let me read something. In the book Bones of Contention, Marvin Ludlow tells the story of Sir Arthur Keith. He was born in 1866. He died in 1955. He was recognized as one of the greatest authorities on human anatomy in the world. And during his youth, he attended a number of different evangelistic services, but his heart was turned against the gospel because he believed that the account of creation in Genesis Chapter 1 was a myth. And so he studied, went to university, received his Ph.D., and while he was studying there, uh, there was a discovery about 40 miles outside of London in 1908, and it was announced by the Geological Society of England that the bones that had been discovered were the remains of the earliest English man ever found. And for Keith, this discovery was life-changing, it confirmed to him everything he believed about evolution and everything that he thought of the falsehood of the Bible. It became for Keith his life work. Some 500 different doctrinal dissertations were written on this particular find 40 miles outside of London. Hundreds of books were written, but Keith was the most prolific author of them all concerning this area. This became his life's work. This is what he put his time into. This is what he wrote about. His most famous work was on evolutionary anatomy, and it was based upon this discovery found 40 miles outside of London. He did this until he was 88 years old. And two years before his death, a group of colleagues came to his home because they wanted to be the first to reach him. And they sat down knowing that he was not in good health. He would die two years later. To tell him that the Piltdown man, that he has spent his life on, was a fraud. That it was nothing but a fabrication. It was a lie. We don't know what he said to those men. But as they left his home that day, you, we can't hardly imagine what it would be like spending your whole life defending, studying, writing, developing on something that was an absolute hoax. You will never regret spending your life And we do know what believers say at the end of their life. We even know what they say after the end of their life in this life. They say with thankful and joyful hearts, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy are you to take the book and break its seals. For you were slain and purchased for God with your blood. Men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and honor and glory and blessing. That is what we will say. A man is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose.
Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we pray as a congregation that we will do far more than 40% of our congregation actively involved in the life of world missions. And I pray, O oh Lord, that you would place your will, your concern, your desires upon each and every one of our hearts. And Lord, may we look back on this missions conference truly as a turning point in our church's concern and desire to send those out around the world who will serve you. This, Lord, is not about us. It is about you. It is about doing your will. Oh, Lord, would you work mightily in our midst. And we pray this in Christ's name. May we stand for the benediction. And now unto him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we ask or think, according to his great power, in the church and in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen.